Oh, hello. You've got up here at Duxford Air Museum. Uh, this place is amazing. I mean, I don't even really need to show you inside all the hangars with all the amazing displays and the restoration workshops and stuff you can walk through. You can just hang out with me here on the uh, side of the airstrip all day and you'll have a great time. Excuse me, I'm trying to speak here. Oh, he's American. Of course he's loud. And, uh, anyway, I'm really joking. You might actually recognise a lot of Duxford because they filmed a lot of the Battle of Britain here and there's a big gap uh, because during the movie they, uh, well, they blew up the hangar. God's teeth. And during the filming of it, they inflicted uh, way more damage than the Luftwaffe ever managed to achieve. Bastards. Anyway, anyway, the reason why we are here is to see the Spies in the Skies exhibition, all about aerial photo reconnaissance. But <laughs> first, let's have a look at this. I couldn't not show you this. I walk in and uh, just this plane just sitting there I was able to go up and have a proper look at it. RN201. This is a Mark 14 later variant Spitfire. Absolutely beautiful, and what a beautiful day as well. Look at that. The five-bladed propeller and the uh, retractable tail wheel there as well. I have to tell you, I was very tempted to hop into the cockpit, but I thought I'd best not mess with it, and uh, probably best not to mess with that uh, Hispano Cannon either. This is built in 1945 on quite a distinctive uh, silver livery. Very striking. I'll give you a proper uh, look into the cockpit here. Uh, I think I can remember the startup procedure, but uh, probably, be probably best that I didn't listen to the voices in my head and uh, give that a Go. A bit unusually for the Mark 14s, it has a uh, the really nice looking high backed fuselage behind the cockpit. I think it looks a lot nicer than the bubble canopy stuff that we'll see a bit later. There's a big blister in the wing there. That's for the big Hispano cannon and a big protrusions on the uh, engine fairing there to house the massive 37 litre uh, Rolls Royce Griffin. Not a Merlin uh, in this associated normally with this type of aircraft. That's uh, it's Porky 2 starting up in the background there. I think it was a uh, I think it was a new. Pilot. They were going up and down uh, practicing uh, taxiing. Not so easy to taxi these actually. The thin wings and the wing spar that uh, make this so good to fly actually mean that the undercarriage there has to be quite narrow so it supports it on uh, landing. Um, uh, excuse me, excuse me, oh, it's more Americans in it. P51 <laughs> uh, there. Oh, very cool, very cool. So, uh, yes, wow, we've literally been here five minutes. Beautiful day, amazing opportunity to have a look at this up close. So let's say goodbye to our friend for now. I think they're off uh, for some off-season uh, maintenance down at the aircraft restoration company. You can see the hangar in the background there. And back to the main event. So this exhibition focuses on aerial photographic reconnaissance, super important part of the intelligence picture, and the exhibit focuses on the Second World War. Um, lots of awesome planes exhibited, including L, that I did a whole video on, and uh, there'll be a link at the end, I'll put to that, PL 983, uh, in her invasion stripe livery here, looking very cool. Um, we'll have a scan around the others there's a sister plane here also a mark 11 uh, both of them in their pr photo reconnaissance blue camouflage to blend in with the sky and uh, a mark 14 uh, just like the silver one we were looking at earlier you'll notice the griffin engine protruding out there and uh, this one a bit different though it has a lowered back fuselage and a bubbly bubble canopy uh, good for visibility but not as cool looking if you ask me and a uh, clipped wing so it can turn a bit tighter they also had a westland lysander a great plane used earlier on uh, very stable but not so fast uh, so replaced by uh, spitfires and mosquitoes a bit later on even this one with uh, the interesting paint scheme that we'll talk about later so of course these planes carried cameras and most if not all of these planes were completely unarmed and relied on speed and altitude alone to evade the enemy uh, unpressurized cockpits freezing cold at high altitude plenty of these guys went out and disappeared never to be heard from again there's no satellites of course in those days so eyes in the sky monitoring your enemy building defenses 
the change in infrastructure, the movement of army units and goods and supplies out of marshalling yards and that really valuable intelligence. We'll talk about all of that. Uh, intelligence gathering is a massive multifaceted operation achieved through many interconnected means. You've got human, t- human intelligence, yes, your uh, your glitzy spies, but also just you know interviewing prisoners of war and SIGINT, which is signals intelligence, you know, intercepting radio signals and stuff, breaking codes and that. And then uh, IMINT, which is imagery intelligence. The government even asked people to send in old holiday postcards to scope out beaches for landings and things like that. Here's uh, Aramanch, uh, codenamed Gold Beach in uh, more peaceful times. Whenever you go to these exhibits, though, it's always fun to spot the military uh, inter-service rivalry. And uh, there was a dubious claim that uh, 80% of British intelligence came from photographic reconnaissance. Bit of a cheeky stat. Uh, uh, does that mean like literal tonnage of paperwork? Uh, I mean, a lot of it is still locked up secret in the National Archives if it wasn't destroyed. Uh, so how can we know? Uh, even assuming something like tonnage, uh, how much was useful or a waste of resources? Um, how would you even start to put a measure on useful, actionable intelligence anyway? Uh, it's clear. I think we could say that it was a collaborative effort between intelligence agencies. The pieced together picture greater than the sum of the parts. We'll see later some pictures from Pinamunda where the V weapons were developed. Uh, Constance Babbage Smith and her team did an amazing job identifying those, but the photos actually sat around for a year uh, and were only re examined after overhearing a bugged conversation between captured generals. So, uh, human intelligence coming through there. And uh, anyway, I don't want to be a stick in the bud. We're, we're getting across the point that this was uh, very important and brilliant work. One fellow who was way ahead of the curve and saw the value of it was a guy by the name of Sidney Cotton and um, this guy was a bit of a character by all accounts and uh, very good at uh, self-promotion let's say. Uh, He somehow convinced MI6 to buy him a plane. This exact one, uh, Lockheed 12A Electra Jr and uh, before the war He went about secretly photographing Europe and uh, he told dashing stories of flying around high-level German officers who were unaware he was taking photos with concealed cameras. Um, For various reasons, it's pretty clear he was telling porkies, but no less of a pioneer and a visionary. And he came up with the idea of heating the cameras to stop icing and also invented the flying suit. Um, So this plane was actually the last civilian aircraft to leave Berlin before the war broke out. At the outbreak of war, the RAF um, got planes specifically outfitted for photo recon, uh, removing the weapons and weight, uh, putting in extra fuel tanks for range, and uh, painting them to camouflage in with the environment. So uh, we saw the planes in PR blue earlier, and this one here, interestingly, is painted pink to blend in with the sky during sunset and sunrise and it was a very important part of the process taking photos at different times of the day uh, to track the movements on the ground and one way that you can tell the exact time is by the angle of the sun by the shadows as well and um, shadows reveal uh, the elevation of buildings and tall structures so you can gain a lot of knowledge just from having different photos of the same area at different times of the day they used a wide array of different cameras i'm not going to pretend to be able to tell you a a lot about this technology but it is super fascinating the development of it and uh, photo recon by the way is still a thing uh, even with satellites and I, i know that around 15 or so years ago they had cameras that were good enough to tell the time on big ben uh from a plane flying over the isle of wight so that's about 70 miles away so uh god knows what they could do now uh these second world war cameras of course used film and if you want a higher resolution and more detail you need to use a bigger film format and these cameras got huge some of them were mounted underneath the plane in the wings in the fuselage some of them were mounted on the side uh, at an oblique angle and that would give you a look at the side of buildings and terrain the best thing about this exhibit was getting to talk to the volunteers who were extremely knowledgeable and more than happy to talk about this stuff, as you can imagine. Uh, one of them told me about how they did the stereoscopic photography. So this is where you have two images 
from slightly different angles uh, of the same thing and through a special viewer you can get the illusion of three dimensions uh, this is actually a thing that goes all the way back to the victorians um, but very powerful tool and i assumed it was uh, done with two lenses uh, side by side but they actually achieved it with one camera taking two images at precise intervals as the plane moved along so the images overlap by 60 percent around that and uh, that meant that the pilot had to be flying perfectly for the illusion to work only some people can see this 3d stereoscope illusion mind and it was one of the screening tests for being an interpreter and the people examining the developed films the interpreters were based at RAF Medmenham and a very highly skilled job it was and uh, they had an array of different photos on display that they would have been examining uh, this one here from the dams raid you can see the Myrna dam clearly breached by the bouncing bomb that hit it i believe this photo was taken by one of the mark 11 spitfires not only did these photo interpreters have to identify a very very wide array of uh, different aircraft and trucks and trains and all sorts of things but uh, it wasn't made easy for them there was all sorts of different camouflage tactics uh, to try and fool them fortifications got hid all over the place disguised as uh, farm houses or haystacks even and one photo interpreter actually uh figured it out because he noticed that uh, the haystacks were the wrong shape for the region of France <laughs> and it turned out that yeah it was actually hiding a field gun they used to do all sorts of things to try and disguise train stations and stuff this is an airfield that they've painted uh, lines on just like uh, like a farmer's fields network and they even had completely fake airfields to try and confuse people but those 3D stereoscopic images helped a lot and a lot of these uh, camouflage attempts stood out like a sore thumb this is from the uh, v weapons testing site in Peenemunda and uh, you can clearly see the uh, importance of the shadows here you can pick out that there is a tool structure a tower and uh, one of the um, interpreters could pick out a uh, truck that they knew the size of and then they could get an idea of the height of the tower the height of the rocket then they can estimate the amount of propellant that might be in it and its range uh, so very valuable intelligence well i barely scratched the surface on this absolutely fascinating subject and i would urge you to go and find more videos and books from people who actually know what they're talking about um it's amazing and if you want to get more videos like this and support me you can click on the patreon link below or click on the link here for some more good stuff